and former Glen Craig Miner was, by 1917, one of the most famous footballers in Britain. He was also one of the truly great footballers of his generation. The rumour first hit the streets of Glasgow in mid-May 1917 and spread like wildfire. Peter Johnson of the Celtic is missing. Just a year earlier, on the 11th of March 1916, and before a Celtic home game against Hamilton Ackies, Peter Johnson, star of the Celtic Football Club, voluntarily enlisted into the army at a Glasgow recruiting office. <laughs> After filling in the forms and sailing through the army medical, he collected his shilling and made his way to Celtic Park, proud as punch. He was now in the army reserve and would await call up to full-time service. Why Peter Johnson, one of the most famous footballers in the country and playing for the most successful team in the country, should voluntarily enlist at that particular time <coughs> is unknown. Full national conscription was still months away and as a coal miner he was working in a reserve occupation which ensured that he would not be called up. Why he enlisted, there is myriad reasons. He may have followed his mates into the army. He may have felt it was his duty to do so. As a minor, he was back in the pits after the SFA and the Scottish League forced professional footballers to take a full-time job out with professional football. And it may have simply been a case that so many men who had escaped the pits he just couldn't tolerate being back underground. We will never know for sure. When Peter enlisted, he chose to serve with the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders. His choice was a brave one. He could have served with many of the service corps and although faced with danger on occasion, they faced nothing like the dangers faced by infantry battalions. The day of his enlistment, Peter duly arrived at Celtic Park with a broad smile on his face and no doubt, as was his style, he burst into the dressing room to cheerily announce the news to his teammates. How long the smile lasted is unknown, but what is known is that Celtic's legendary manager, Willie Maley, was less than pleased when he heard Peter's announcement. His manager's reaction wasn't self-interest or a lack of commitment to the war effort. Mealy was himself the son of a soldier who at the time had a son serving with the Royal Dublin Fusiliers. Mealy was fiercely patriotic and simply felt that a high-profile player like Peter Johnson served the war effort better by remaining in the pits and contributing to the morale of tens of thousands of war workers whose few pleasures included watching a game of football on a Saturday afternoon. In addition, by playing charity matches, the game of football itself was contributing tens of thousands of pounds to the myriad relief funds that were going on at the time. These included scores of relief funds aimed specifically at soldiers and sailors. The success of these relief games very much depended on the star players putting in an appearance and certainly Peter Johnson's name on the team sheet would have drawn in the crowds. In mid-May 1916, another football season finished with Celtic having won the league championship for a third time in a row, the Glasgow Charity Cup and the Glasgow FA Cup. It also signalled the departure of Peter Johnson to begin his infantry training with the Argyles in the south of England. For the next six months, Peter trained for war. Over the period, he managed to get home on a number of occasions and in one occasion helped Celtic to a 3-2 victory over Clyde, which saw another winner's medal added to Peter's already impressive collection. 
By the turn of the year, Peter's military training was complete, and the big fifer waited a draft order that would send him to one of the fighting Argyle battalions. Around February 1917, Peter and a large draft of Argyles were assigned to the 14th Battalion Argyle and Southern Highlanders, then fighting in France. Peter's draft landed in France and made their way to an infantry training base depot, where they were held for further training and to be used as labour on large construction and entrenching tasks. While there, the famous Celt managed to get in a couple of football games, representing the base depot team. On the 9th of April 1917, the Battle of Arras began. The 6th Battalion Seaforth Highlanders were involved in a partially successful but very costly action during the first day of the battle. In order to bring the Seaforth Battalion back up to a viable fighting strength, Peter Johnson and a large number of his fellow Argyles were compulsorily transferred to the Seaforth Highlanders and sent to reinforce the 6th Morrisher Battalion. On the 12th of May, the 6th Seaforth re-entered the Battle of Arras when they went back into the fighting line opposite the chemical works at Rue. The whole battle area was like a butcher's yard, the stuff of absolute nightmares. The fighting over the previous month had been too intense for any attempt to be made to collect or bury the dead. The entire area was littered with corpses. Between the village of Fampu and the chemical works at Rue, the British dead lay in swathes, decaying since the attack of the 9th of April. As the men crossed the last ridge, the carnage was inescapable. Everywhere they looked, they gazed on the horrors of decomposition. The heavy losses sustained by Highland battalions, in particular, were glaringly apparent as the kilts of the fallen stood out against the shell-scarred landscape. On arrival in the sector, the soldiers were immediately uneasy. Picking up the air of depression and foreboding which hung over the place, one jock said, to be in the comical works made a body windy, whether it was being shelled or not. The title of comical works was an attempt at black humour, but in reality there was nothing funny about the Rue chemical works sector. For the next five days the Seaforths fought at times desperate hand-to-hand -hand engagements as the fighting raged around the chemical works. In these intensely personal encounters, no quarter was asked for or given. Both sides launched counter-attacks that were beaten back in turn. In between the attacks, intense artillery barrages gave the weary infantrymen no respite. By the evening of the 17th of May, the 6th Sea Force had been relieved and were back at Arish town licking their wounds. They had again suffered sore losses. Two officers killed, three wounded, one missing, 41 other ranks killed, 48 wounded and 25 missing. Among the soldiers reported missing was Celtic's Peter Johnson. Very often, the first news that the families heard of a casualty came from neighbours or acquaintances. They had received a letter from a soldier at the front who'd mentioned that so-and-so was killed, wounded or missing. Rumours that the great Peter Johnson of Celtic was unaccounted for began to circulate in Glasgow a week after the sea force came out of action. When the rumour reached Parkhead, Willie Maley made strenuous inquiries using his many military contacts to discover the fate of Big Peter, while Celtic club director 
Colonel John Shaughnessy, then the Army Recruiting Officer for Glasgow, also tried to get some information, but to no avail. A few days later, the dreaded official telegram was pushed through Isa Johnson's letterbox. Peter was officially reported as being missing in action between the 12th and 16th of May 1917. Shortly after notifying Isa that Peter was missing, something of Peter or something belonging to him was found in the battlefield. That allowed the military authorities to change the missing in action status to killed in action and to specify the date of death as the 16th of May 1917. What was found to change the status is unknown, but there was no body ever recovered and therefore no grave, most certainly because there was little left to recover or bury. The loss to Peter's family was of course immense and Isa Johnson never remarried, bringing up her two children, Nellie and Peter on her own. The Celtic also first suffered a grievous loss, for Peter Johnson was unquestionably one of the outstanding footballers of his generation and a great favourite with his supporters. When he left the club to join the army, he was only 28 and at the peak of his career. He had already clocked up 233 senior appearances. Had he survived to return to Parkhead, he would undoubtedly have gone on to be a true Celtic legend. Peter Johnson is commemorated on the Arras Memorial to the Missing. The memorial commemorates over 35,000 men who have no known grave and who fell in the Arras sector. Peter Johnson's name can be found on the Seaforth Highlanders, Bay Number 8. Now, thanks to the magnificent efforts of the Peter Johnson Memorial Group, supported by Peter's descendants, the people of Fife, and very many Celtic supporters, in addition to that corner of a foreign field, Big Peter is now also remembered and commemorated at home in this corner of a Fife field. Lest we forget.